You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. All right, welcome back in to another episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. My name is Alex Duvall. I am back this week, joined by Joel Penfield, my co-host for, are we going on three three years now, or is it almost four, four years? Almost four years, dude. Almost it's pretty years. crazy, yeah. We came up on the fifth anniversary of Royals Farm Report uh, recently. I found uh, Twitter alerted me that we had our fifth year anniversary, and then I went back and found uh, Pat's old piece on Chris DeVito, which is always a fun <laughs> read, just this. Like you go back and like scroll through some of the old oh things. Oh my god! Like, a the Royals farm system used to be so bad that we were uh, we were hyped up about like Chase Velo and Foster Griffin and yeah, like those Corey types of guys. Toops was in Triple A, yeah. like maybe. But um, B just you know being young and, and and working our way through the understanding of how everything works. And I mean now Pat's working for the Phillies, so yeah, uh, how far we come. So Joel, you celebrated your anniversary. I celebrated my anniversary. Today's Father's Day. It's been a busy week. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've seen your beautiful face on this app. How have we been? Oh, hanging in there, man. Yeah, my wife and I celebrated our, our third wedding anniversary this week. Uh, we did like a joint like anniversary Father's Day thing where we dropped our son off at my parents' house and went to downtown Kansas City and drank our way around Brewer's Alley and had a, a night to ourselves without having to worry about getting back in time for bedtime for, for the kiddo. So it was a very welcome change and a very nice, uh, very nice way to spend a weekend. That's awesome. I just got back from Colorado. We were camping up in the steamboat area. So oh, nice. It has been it's been a long week. I'm glad to be home. Uh, really quick before we get into the podcast, we'll hear a word from our sponsor, Kansas City Strength and Conditioning. From the beginning, we knew right away that we wanted to do strength conditioning and a throwing program for the baseball and softball community. It wasn't something we were trying to back into or all of a sudden learn. We knew we were really good at these coaching these skills from the get-go. And the fact that we're in the same business and the employees are all on the same page, you know, we can write a program based off of what a kid needs, not just getting him stronger or faster from a general sense. It's what does this kid need? On the pitching end, we can say, hey, this kid needs such and such. He needs to do this or that better. A lot of times it turns out it's not something that needs to be fixed in the baseball cage or on the throwing mound. It actually needs to be fixed in the weight room. Big thanks to Kansas City Strength and Conditioning for picking up the show this year. I've got a kid who's up there working out right now and has said nothing but good things. So really glad uh, to have them on board helping out the podcast. Joel, can we talk about Salvador Perez for a little bit? Yes, please. I'm he, I, I'm good with that. I was reminiscing the other night. I had literally just gotten home. And I, I don't know about you, but like when I get done with a busy day, I can't just get home and go to bed because my brain – go scatterbrain and I have to like unwind. So I actually get home about seven o'clock. The Royals on Friday night didn't play till like eight 40 local time. So I'm like, perfect. So put the kid down, um, wife went to bed and then it was just me up. So I watched the Royals game. It's, you know, 1230 before the game ends and I'm up enjoying some time to myself after driving for 13 hours that day. Right. So Salvador Perez is working with Daniel Lynch. He hits, a home run and a double or something like that on Friday night. And he's up there doing an interview with Joel Goldberg. And I was just like, I love this man so much. And that's when I tweeted out. Um, if you saw it on Twitter, I tweeted out four pictures of Salvi when he was really young from like his prospect days to the, when he debuted yeah. in 2011. I remember I was watching his debut. I don't remember where I was, but I was watching his debut. It was the t- the game was on TV at this restaurant I was in. 
when Salvi picked off two base runners, got his first hit, his first RBI, was catching foul balls like he'd been doing it his whole career. And I mean, like he'd been doing it as a veteran, right? And it was just, you know, reminiscing through the wild card game and Salvi's legacy in Kansas City. It is going to hurt me in my soul when Salvi retires. And I know we got years before that's a conversation, right? He's under contract in 23, 24, 25, club option in 26. Salvi's going to be around for a while. But, Joel, I want to talk about his legacy. Like, in terms of there's three numbers on the outfield wall, right, at Kauffman Stadium, two players and a coach. Is it safe to assume that number two is going to be retired at some point? Number two? No. Well, no, hang on. What number was Ned Yost? Number three. Oh, yeah. Duh. My bad. I, okay. I think there's a good possibility that number three is up there, but I, I know where you're going with this. And I've been saying since the beginning of last year, when he re-upped his deal, I said, okay, 13 is going to be up there as well. He embodies Royals baseball to our generation the way that number five did to our parents and, uh, and the older generation of Royals fans. He's that type of guy. Is he a Hall of Famer, surefire, the way George Brett was? I don't think so, at least right now. But you want a ring here, just like George did. There's a good chance he's going to spend his entire career in Royals blue. He's just, he's the guy. And I have nothing but love and admiration watching him go out there and grind every single day. It's it's incredible. Uh, I we're watching one of the all time greats in our franchise's history right now. And I know that it's been tough sledding for most of it, but I mean, you just got to love 13, man. You just do. I was thinking about him and Lorenzo Kane got DFA'd by the Brewers this week. And I was reminiscing on the, the shenanigans that Salvi used to pull on low Kane and all oh, yeah. those guys <laughs> to playing together and how much fun that team was. And I have a, an unhealthy obsession with the Royals every now and then, like once a year, maybe around October, I watched that old YouTube video, the Royals blue October, it's oh, like it's a 30 so minute good. rundown yeah. of each playoffs. And I tear up a little bit. I mean, that was a time speaking of father's day that, you know, going through college where I would come back and watch games with my dad and my, the rest of my family. And we were, we were at some of the playoff games. We were in New York when they won the world series, but just those, those runs mean so much to me and my family just as, again, having an unhealthy obsession with this ball club. And I think Salvador Perez, like you said, is the heart of all of that. So if you ask me, I think three and maybe four, wrong hand, four, get retired by the time it's all said and done. And then I think 13 probably goes up there with them. If, if not Alex Gordon, then probably Yost and Salvi of that group. Mm -hmm. But – Beyond his impact on the field, I've never seen a guy be so, I mean, he and Patrick Mahomes be so beloved universally, not just by the community, but by the the background and the community of the of the entire sport. Yep. It's just I I don't know that enough people stop and, and realize how lucky we are to get to watch Salvador Perez in Royal Blue. But I was thinking about that the other night when he came up to bat for like the fourth time, I think, after he hit his home run. And I was watching that game thinking, like, man, like we we could live another 40 years of watching Royals baseball and not see a player like this. It, it's entirely possible. So anyway, I was just reminiscing about that. And it, and it brought up a, another point of Salvi's under contract for three years after this year, at least three years. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the long-term plan for M.J. Melendez? He's been playing right field. He looks okay out there. At some point, you'd like him to be the catcher of the future, so he needs to be behind the plate more than he is at now probably. But I think they're handling it okay for now while he yeah. learns. But how do you think they split that moving forward? I think next year we probably see something similar to a 50-50 split. If not, M.J. by the middle of the year kind of takes over. I think I think this is probably the last year that we see Salvador Perez as the full time catcher for the Royals, and by full time I mean the primary guy. Uh, I think next year he becomes a little more of the the catch two or three times a week, DH the rest of the time, and then on the days when he's catching, then you know Sal and then uh, MJ can DH and or play right field, something like that. But it feels like that's the direction they're heading. I'm glad that they're not just 
dumping everything on MJ and like, hey, dude, you're you're the catcher. You got to take over for the legend. Congrats, go do it now. I think they've done a good job of finding ways to get him in the lineup. He's held his own in right field, which I think is encouraging if you want to continue to send Salvi out there to catch and you still want to roster a guy like a Cam Gallagher or a Sebastian Rivero, something like that, to have a true, just consummate professional catcher behind the plate and let MJ be the athlete that he is. So I, I think they're handling it pretty well right now. This was so we we've talked about this uh, last year too about what they would do, and it felt like this was kind of the move that they would work M- MJ. The bat was going to play, get the bat in the lineup, and let him work in slowly to becoming the next backstop for the Royals for the foreseeable future. He is, he has impressed me more this year than I ever thought possible. Yep. You go you go on a run like he did last year in the minors, and it happens. I mean, for a catcher to lead minor league baseball in home runs, that doesn't really happen all the time. But you see guys all the time who outplay realistic projection in the minors. And this year, he has just stepped right up and kept doing exactly what he was doing, save for hitting 40 home runs, right? He's got a 201 ISO, a 348 on base, a 129 weighted runs created plus. There's nothing that you could have expected him to do more of at the big league level, except maybe hit a few more home runs. And I mean, yeah. really, we gonna, is that what we're going to complain about? He's got six in the big leagues right now. Like he is doing everything that we thought he was going to do and more And it. And it kind of watching MJ in the big leagues kind of makes me wish there were more guys like that, more mm-hmm. young guys up getting a chance, but we'll get to them in a little bit. But I was I was watching the Royals all weekend. I got to watch all three games if they're not watching them for a week. And and one thing that really struck me after watching three games in a row is man, there there is so much talent on this team for having a win percentage around like a third. Mm-hmm. And I think the beginnings of that the of the turnaround come with young guys playing multiple positions, mixing in with the veterans and getting a good combination of production from Salvi and Hunter Dozier and presently Whit Merrifield combined with bringing in the young guys and letting them be stars. And it's been more promising than watching a bad team. Like then like if, if we were watching the, the Tigers right now, oh yeah, with some of their young guys really struggling and just being all around bad with no real end in sight. I think it's it'd be harder to watch, but with some of the young guys they are playing having success, a it's like okay, I can see where this would could turn around in a year or two. But b it's like man, let's get some more of these young guys up. Why aren't why isn't Vinny P up here already? Why isn't Nick Prado up here already? So. Anyway, that was just something I was thinking about while watching the games this week. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this on One Royal Way this week. We will have an episode this Thursday or Friday. I apologize for last week, but could not get a a second person to join me. So it's just the way that it worked out. But the main point that I wanted to bring up, and I think it's still very reasonable and it's so relevant, for all of the fanfare and for all of the, the wow moments and for all of the, you know, warranted, uh, buzz that Bobby Wood Jr. has got and has gotten this season for some of the plays that he has make has made and for what he has been able to accomplish so far as he's still figuring things out. The star potential is there. We need to put that same amount of energy into MJ Melendez because he has been as good, if not better, at times than Bobby Wood Jr. Certainly at the plate. At you know, but MJ has legitimately put together the best at bats on this team consistently since he got called up. And that is including Carlos Santana and the veterans that have been around for a long time. MJ has been doing that along with playing multiple positions, a position in right field where that he hasn't played. He played what a handful of times in triple a. I don't know that he played any out there. He played like once or twice. And then they asked him to go out. Oh yeah. You're going to go out and play right field, the biggest outfield in major league baseball. And you're going to go make diving plays doing it. And they're going to come up and you're going to go bridge to the deepest part of the park in the biggest outfield at, you know, in major league baseball. He has done everything the Royals have asked of him and more. And he has been as good as a guy that we laud as a potential top 10 superstar in the game. I mean, if MJ is doing this now as a rookie, is he still getting acclimated? My God, man, his ceiling is ridiculous. I did not expect him to come up and have the same the success he's having right now. I thought he'd be good. He's a solid big leaguer. He is a pro's pro, handles himself the right way. 
And he's also having the really good production on top of that. He's been one of the best rookies in Major League Baseball this year, and that's not me trying to be a homer or exaggerate. That's what he's been doing. Yeah, and I think the the best part about it is he was supposed to be like the second or third best hitter of that group, mm -hmm. and he looks like maybe he could be the best. But I think it again is is promise for the guys who are behind him. As we get more oriented towards the minor leaguers here, I want to talk about the trade deadline just a little bit. I think what Nate Eaton and Michael Massey and Nicky Lopez and Bobby Witt Jr. and Emmanuel Rivera have done over the last year and a half is leading us to the first legitimate opportunity for Whit Merrifield to be traded yes. in his Royals tenure. Ever since he snapped out of his funk, he's got a 112 rated weighted runs created plus over the last month and a half, right? This is since May 10th, so a, a month and some change here. We're not talking about a small sample. In fact, the small sample was him struggling. Mm -hmm. With Merrifield seems to be back. He's doing exactly what he did to be an all-star. And there are teams he, who could use his services. And when you have minor leaguers and prospects and young guys who can fill the void and convince the front office that, hey, Kyle Isbell, Edward Olivares, Hunter Dozier, Edward Emmanuel Rivera, right? These guys that you were waiting on to prove something have proved something. And now you can afford to trade a guy like Witt to Atlanta, to Seattle, whoever needs him, and potentially get yourself a good return. If they trade Whit Merrifield, Andrew Benintendi, who's having the best his best year since like 2018, field offers on a Michael A. Taylor, maybe you flip a Scott Barlow, a Josh Stamont, you could add a ton of young talent to this oh, team yeah. so that the runs don't stop when you lose inevitably one of these guys, right? So before we get into the minor league minute here, the A ball teams right now are struggling big time. They could use an influx of talent. I know you guys have talked about the trade deadline on one Royal way a little bit, but really quick before we end our big league conversation here of the guys who could be reasonably traded, Joel, I want your top three must trades this July. It's Andrew Benintendi, it's Whit Merrifield, and I think it's Scott Barlow or Josh Stamon. It's one of the relievers. And I, and I would still certainly field offers on Michael A. Taylor. He has exceeded any expectation that we had for him this season. Uh, no coincidence that Whit Merrifield and Michael A. Taylor both started turning it around when the when Mike Tosar and Alex Zumwalt are in uniform and helping out. I think that you can make that correlation that there's obviously some change, legitimate changes that were made there, which is encouraging for the offense in totality at the big league level. But those will be the three that I think you try and move. I think Atlanta is going to get desperate and they probably want a guy like Whit Merrifield because they can not only use him at second base until Ozzy Albies comes back, which he won't be back until eight September. weeks. Yeah. About right around August, September. And then you can still throw him in the outfield and that worst teacher fourth outfielder. And for a team that is looking to go and defend their world series title. So that, that would be, I think that's the most obvious move. Andrew Benintendi should be moved, and I, I think teams are going to want him. And the reason that I think that you should go trade a Barlow or Stamont, everybody needs relievers. Everybody. doesn't matter how good your bullpen is. You always got to stock it up. And teams will overpay for a really good reliever, especially one like Scott Barlow that you can send out for two outs in the sixth and go get the seventh as well, or get the last out of the eighth and go close out the game or just come in in the ninth and close out the game. Teams will overpay for that. And you probably can get a, a team to bite on a really good, you know, one of their a prospect that they're like, this guy's in our top 10, but man, we really need this guy. And they could probably make that move. I think teams tend to hoard prospects a little bit as it is, but I think with Barlow and Stamont, the best way to use them this year is not to trade like, we talk about Wit to Atlanta. So we trade Wit to Atlanta and then we trade Stamont to Texas, whoever, for a top 15 guy in Atlanta and then a top 15, top 25 guy in Texas. I think you package them together and go for a top five talent in somebody's system. And I think both of these guys have the ability to take Wit Merrifield and Andrew Benintendi both. So let's say you package Benintendi with Barlow, Wit with Stamont. I think that enables you to get two different teams, 
a top five prospect in each system and bring them back, which again, as we get into the minor league minute here in just a second, we have a couple of teams who need that influx of talent. You go to the draft, you draft a couple of kids who can go into those A ball teams and fill some more of that void. And all of a sudden, the system goes from having a little bit of depth now that some of these guys are graduating to a ton of depth because you have made the necessary moves to bring in an influx of talent. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to actually take a little bit of a break right here. We're going to throw it to an ad break and then we're going to come back and do our minor league minute. If you're looking to take your crew out to the K this summer, be sure to check out our friends at Tickets for Less. Ticketsforless.com has the best selection of tickets for all your favorite sporting events, concerts, and shows, including the Royals. Tickets for Less never charges per ticket fee, saving you big time over the other sites out there. You can even save more when you use our exclusive partner code at checkout. Simply enter code KCSN22 when ordering your seats at Ticketsforless.com. That code again is KCSN22. Memories for life start at ticketsforless.com. Okay, let's get into the minor league minute. Thanks to our uh, sponsors on the advertisement side of things. Uh, really quick, we're going to get in the minor league minute brought to us this year by Drum Farm. Drum Farm Center for Children out on Lee Summit Road in Lee Summit, Missouri. They do all kinds of great work in the foster care system. They've got a farmer's market that they're running on Saturday mornings, all sa- every Saturday, all summer. You go out there and get some fresh cinnamon rolls some fresh produce. They've even got like, I I don't know how else to say it, but like grow your own tomato plants, right? You can get a plant, take it home, put it in the ground, grow your own tomatoes. They got a petting zoo out there for the kids. It's a really good time. It's It's a little thing. It's not a lot going on, but the kids who are a part of the foster care system at Drum Farm run it. Everything that you pay for and donate goes to them directly. So go feed the goats, go feed sweet pea, sweet peas, the donkey. Um, (laughs) But anyway, thanks to Drum Farm for picking up the minor league minute this year. Joel, get us started. All right, so we'll head down to Columbia. The Fireflies, they lost four out of six against the Carolina Mudcats. Unfortunately, this is nothing new for them this season. It's been a real struggle for those guys. Uh, We saw some bright spots in here. Ben Kuderna has still been ridiculously awesome for them. Goes four and a third, no runs, three hits, six strikeouts, only two walks. ERA is still .50 on the season. Frank Mazzucato looked pretty solid overall. Uh, a couple walks, scattered a few hits, but no runs and four innings for him. That's a career high for him at this point with five strikeouts. And he only walked two. So they were starting to see some of the command come back for him a little bit. Shane Panzini was okay. He was, you know, it was it was a middling start for him. Went three and a third, gave up a few runs and hits. A couple strikeouts, the walks are starting to, to pile up for him a little bit, but I'm not, nothing to be worried about at that point. Rivertown and Carter Jensen hit their eighth home run on the season, uh, each on Saturday. And then Daniel Vasquez, uh, who's 19, he's, you know, he's only played a certain, you know, like 20 something games for, uh, the Fireflies at this point, he had two hits on Sunday. And then Dayton Dooney, who was late getting there to, uh, late getting to Columbia has only played eight or nine games. He got his first a ball homer. So that's what we're seeing down in Columbia. There's unfortunately not a ton of, uh, to talk about. With these guys, so I said they only won 18 games this season. They're they're getting roughed up pretty bad. Of very humbling experience there for got a lot of guys in their first round of pro ball. It's been a weird go for Columbia, and I can't help but watch and think, man, it's a little bit like the Royals, where this team is way too talented to have this many struggles. But again, you get to a team in, in any low A team, the pitching depth can only be so great. There's going to be offensive struggles when you're that young. In Quad Cities, they've had some similar struggles. I got my Banditos hat on. Thanks, Twitter, for voting for this one. It is one of my new favorite hats. It is – I don't know if you guys can see it real well. But, yeah, it's It's got the – It's a great hat. Go check it out on YouTube. It is phenomenal. So, Quad Cities this week actually took four of six from the South Bend Cubs. Diego Hernandez is the guy I want to talk about really quick. Diego Hernandez is a 129 weighted runs created plus – if you're talking about a prospect who still has a chance to be a borderline everyday center fielder, he might be the only one in the system. Yeah. I love John Rave. I don't think he's an everyday center fielder. Nick Lofton, they've moved back to second base semi, uh, semi-regularly, so I think it's pretty clear. They don't think he's a r- everyday center fielder. There's not that guy in AAA, although we'll get to that in a minute. There's nothing really in low A unless you think Eric Payne is a center fielder, which I don't. I think he's more like a right fielder. So 
if you're looking for a center fielder in the system anywhere, I think it's Diego Hernandez. He's doesn't hit for a lot of power. He still strikes out more than you'd like for a guy who doesn't really hit for much power. And his BABIP is kind of holding up his overall offensive stats, but he's up his line drive rate. He's got some sneaky raw power. He's a great runner. He stole his 20th base. Uh, I can check that. He stole base number 20 earlier this week. So he does some good things. He's a great defender in center field. He's got a cannon for an arm. There's some stuff to dream on there. But Diego Hernandez, I felt like, was worth mentioning, even if he's not a top 30 prospect in my mind just yet. Tyler Tolbert is a man possessed 30 stolen bases this year. Still has not been caught stealing. That is a feat that is actually really difficult, I found. I was researching like stolen base success rates in the minors, guys who stole 30 bases and have not been caught, and it hasn't been done in a long time. There is um, a guy in the Philly system. can't remember his name. Johan Rojas, maybe. Anyway, he's in the Philly system. He's done it this year so far, but again, there's a lot of year left to get caught stealing. Uh, down on the farm on the mound, though, in Quad Cities, Rylan Kaufman continues to do good things, continues to be a guy that I think has a big league future in some capacity if a few breaks go his way. 22-year-old left-handed pitcher, 6'4", 225, good K rates, kind of gets hit around a little bit, but not like hard, just leaves the ball over the middle to enable contact in some capacity. RPMs on his curveball are over 3,000, so he has a couple of tools that are not teachable. Fastball, 93-94, great spin. Curveball, great spin. If he could throw that curveball more like 82-83 instead of 77-78, it would help. But for now, I think you just kind of look at him as a 22-year-old pitching prospect who has the necessary tools to make it happen if he can develop some more pitchability. So that is what I got for you in Quad Cities this week. Headed to Northwest Arkansas, they split against their uh, fellow in-state team, the Arkansas Travelers, this week. They got blown out a couple of times, and they're like 18-3 to and 13-2. to It wasn't pretty, but they were able to shut out Arkansas on Saturday and Sunday, 9-0 and 4-0, respectively. Anthony Veneziano has looked great for the last couple of weeks. Had the bookend starts in the six-game series, so he started on Tuesday and Sunday. Got wins in each, 12 innings, 7 hits. Three runs, 13 strikeouts, only three walks, which is so significant for him. The walks have come down a lot over the last couple of weeks. He was Texas League Pitcher of the Week uh, in the previous episode that Josh and I recorded. It's really nice to see, I but I don't know the, the lack of velocity that from what we saw last year. I don't know if it's an injury thing. I don't know if it's a the Royals are trying to hone in some of the some of that a little bit to help him extend out over the course of a full season. He was up to triple digits last year. He's been more 90 to 93 this year. And I do wonder, as I was thinking about him and how he has pitched the last couple of weeks, I wonder if now he's starting to pitch more or like learn how to pitch without needing to go to 99. Like if it was, he was trying to be too fine while not throwing as hard. And when you're nibbling or when you're trying to aim the ball, you're not going to get it there. It seems like he seems more comfortable now throwing with, the velocity that he did not have last year, which he led the entire organization in strikeouts. So I don't know what you think about that, but that, that's what I've been kind of theorizing on recently. Tyler Gentry was called up from Quad Cities, uh, got his first run at double A, hit two home runs, uh, still displaying a lot of the same power and uh, bat to ball skills that he was in, doing in Quad Cities. So nice to see for him. I know Josh is very excited about that. Michael Garcia has his second home run in the year, two weeks in a row. Oh, the home run for a guy with not a lot of power, so that's pretty fun. Uh, the overall pitching outside of Anthony Veneziano, a real mixed bag. Alec Marsh and Christian Chamberlain were not good at all. They got absolutely blown up, both of them. Will Klein had some some good stuff, but also was kind of okay. Angel Zerpa was okay. They're just It was kind of a weird week in general with you get two blowouts and then you play pretty well. Uh, on the bookends of the series. And then very quietly, our guy Logan Porter, hit, still hitting 329, OPS over 1,000, only guy with an OPS over 1,000 in that lineup. I don't know what to make of Logan Porter, but it certainly is a fun story. I'll just leave it there. He he can hit. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's going to buy you some time in professional baseball. If you can hit, no matter how bad you are defensively, no matter how old you are, no matter 
no matter what, we've seen it with Frank Schwindel getting an extended opportunity with the Cubs. If you can hit, people will find a place for you no matter what. So so good on Logan Porter. Maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't, but it's cool to watch. Um, he was an integral part of that high A championship team last year in Quad City. So it's cool to watch him succeed, even if he's not a prospect necessarily, just in terms of being in the middle of, well, what was Michael Massey and the next guy behind him? Just having protection so that pitchers yep. have to pitch to Massey, who which they hadn't been. So getting Massey up to, to Omaha, speaking of, Michael Massey in Omaha so far is having himself, had himself a week. He hit 263 with an 849 OPS his first week in Omaha. He did not miss a beat on that transition. He now has 10 home runs and 10 stolen bases on the season. I think my preseason prediction was he hit 25, so a little slow on the home run count, but he just keeps hitting. A 113 yep. weighted runs created plus at AA, a 130 weighted runs created plus now at AAA. He, his rise through the system, I think is, and again, I mentioned it earlier, something that might allow them to trade with Merrifield. I, I really believe that. I really believe if, because another guy I was going to mention, Nate Eaton, Nate Eaton keeps hitting. Nate Eaton now is hitting, well, he hit 267 this week. And then in Omaha so far, Nate Eaton has hit, just a second, Nate Eaton has hit. 250 with a 130 weighted runs created plus because he's hitting for a ton of power. So you've got a guy in Nate Eaton who I've compared to Whit Merrifield in the past, just in terms of a toolsy utility type, right? So Nate Eaton, Michael Massey, Kyle Isbell, Edward Olivares, you now have a, what did, what did Brad Pitt say in Moneyball? You recreate him in the aggregate, right? Yes. We don't necessarily have one Whit Merrifield, but we have three or four guys who could kind of recreate Whit Merrifield against righties, against lefties, in center field, in second base, in right field, in left field. And now, instead of having one wit, you have four guys on the roster who two at a time or three at a time or off the bench can help recreate what Whit Merrifield was. So maybe this is the year they trade wit. I Maybe they never do. But I really believe that Michael Massey and Nate Eaton, who, again, are currently raking in their short stint with AAA Omaha, are going to allow them to trade wit if they want to. So we will circle back to this uh, pretty soon. Drew Parrish made his first start or two with AAA Omaha. Drew Parrish has made two starts now with Omaha. Second one went much better than the first. Five innings, one run, two strikeouts, two walks, as opposed to seven strikeouts and four earned runs. In his first go with AAA Omaha, he's a guy that I don't think is ever going to be a number one, two, three, or four. But could he be a big league starter in some capacity and pitch to a 3-9 to 4-2-5 ERA, make 30 starts a year? Potentially, I think, maybe maybe he's a reliever, I don't know. But Drew Parrish's ascension through the system is just another example of them finding depth when they need it. Jonathan Heasley, a 13th round pick, is that so right? Like 10th, I think it was 10th or 11th. But yeah, okay. like either way, like mid-round Pick. Mid-round pick who they've turned into a legitimate big league starting pitching prospect. You try it with guys like Noah Cameron. You try it with guys like, um, oh, my brain, Zach Hockey, right? Zach Hockey, it hasn't necessarily worked out for him yet, but you go get him out of Kentucky. He's had some success. He's got good stuff. Maybe he works out. Maybe he doesn't. But you keep throwing enough spaghetti at the wall, and eventually a meatball or two sticks. So Drew Parrish, John Heasley, maybe those are the meatballs who stick, maybe not but he has pitched really well and is another good example of the Royals, if not pitching development, at least good scouting and a good head on their shoulders in terms of adding their own pitching into the system and then seeing what happens from there. Yeah. I, and I'm going back to, to Massey and Eaton. I've, I've said it and I'm going to continue to say it. Michael Massey should be your starting second baseman in 2023. Now that this is meaning that you're probably making a move for like what Merrifield is either been traded in some capacity i don't know what they're going to do with nikki lopez if that happens but i think massey's upside is significantly higher at this point the glove is about on par and massey's got a better he's hitting the ball better hits for a little more power i think there's just a lot more potential there and i'm not trying to slander nikki lopez i just think i think a lot higher of michael massey at this point and then i'm going to start referring to nate eaton as future big leaguer nate eaton 
I, yeah, I, we used that for Gabe Spire for a long, you know, for a few years, but it is now future big leaguer Nate Eaton. Ever since the John Jay trade, he's been future big leaguer Gabe Spire. So I am down with the future big leaguer Nate Eaton. And Nate Eaton had never appeared on our top 30, by the way, until this past off season. He went down to the Arizona Fall League and he was good. He didn't tear it up or anything. I know for a while he was hitting like 400, but it was a soft 400. But it was something, I don't know what it was for me that clicked, but I was watching him handle himself against some of the premier pitching prospects in minor league baseball. And I was like, you know what? Like he fits, like he looks the part, his swing plays. It's short, it's compact, it's good hands. It's an explosive swing. If he makes an adjustment or two, there's a, there's room for him in a big league lineup. So he was prospect number 30 on our list this last off season. And I can tell you for sure, he will be in the top 20 at midseason unless the Royals just kill the draft and I'm forced to have Nate Eaton like 21 or 22. But I, I'm in. I'm a believer in Nate Eaton. I think he's only he's only 25 years old, so it's not like he's crazy old. Like Logan Porter being 26 in double A is yeah, harmful to your prospect status. But 25, knocking down the door of the big leagues, I can get behind that. So I agree. And he's Nate playing Eaton. center field now in Omaha. So that is, when I saw that he – when he got called up, he's played some third – played some left. They've kind of moved him around. He's, I think he played a little bit of second base too. And they put him in center field the other day. And that to me goes, I think they're trying to find, find something for this guy because they think he actually could be part of this. 100%. I don't think he's, I don't even think he's, I don't know if he's necessarily a big league regular. I think he is your perfect super utility type yes. where he can do everything. And it's not like he's necessarily amazing at the amazing center. He's just, He's just a solid ball player. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the Whit Merrifield comp comes in. Like Whit Merrifield is not spectacular at second base. He's not spectacular in right. He's just good. And he's just, uh, the power isn't spectacular, but it's, you know, it's good enough. You know, he just does everything really well. And so I think that is recreating number 15 in the aggregate. Getting Nate Eaton in the ball club. Let's focus on Massey and Eaton there in terms of what do we mean by recreating Witt in the aggregate? So what can Witt do? Witt can play right field adequately. He can move to center in a pinch if you need him to. He can play second base at a almost gold glove level. Yep. Michael Massey won the gold glove minor league gold glove award at second base last year. Nate Eaton has played second, third, right, and center in his minor league career. Michael Massey is a left-handed stick. Nate Eaton's a right-handed stick. Nate Eaton has stolen, thir- uh, I don't want to say 30. He's stolen close to 30 bases in a minor league season before. He can really run. Michael Massey has himself 10 stolen bases this year. Michael Massey can hit for some power. Nate Eaton has a good approach. We'll walk a little bit. We'll hit for some right-handed thump. But it, if you platoon them, I'm not saying you will get Whit Merrifield, but if you platoon Massey and Eaton in some capacity with Nicky Lopez on the infield, Kyle Isbell, Edward Olivares, and you work these guys in, I think all of a sudden you can recreate value that is very close to Whit Merrifield. So that is kind of what we mean by recreate him in the aggregate. Omaha this week went two and four to the Iowa Cubs, but they had a plus run differential. They won the two games they won. They won by a combined 12 runs and the four games they lost, they lost by a combined 10 runs. So Oof. two very explosive games for not a so explosive games. I was watching this and I was looking Vinny Pasquantino already has nearly 80 at bats versus left-handed pitchers this year. Those are just at bats. I didn't even look at walks to, and sack mm-hmm. flies and stuff to factor in plate appearances, but he has like a third of his plate appearances are versus left-handed pitchers. And I was looking at other AAA hitters, and he has by far more left-handed at bats than the average hitter, right? And it's like Every time I watch a game, teams are running out another lefty. They won't even leave right-handed pitchers in to face him. Like yeah. if Denny is up when the game is on the line, here comes a left-handed reliever. And it happens over and over and over and over and over. I think at the moment, it's close to like 80 and 160 or something like that in terms of at-bats. So like right at like a third of his at-bats. I don't have him pulled up, but it's insane. He and Prado both, they will not let righties face him. And I feel... Like that's that's a pretty good sign that the the other teams know and the Royals are just over here, you know what, and Carlos Santana until they can find a spot for him. So anyway, that's the shift the now. shift that Iowa played on Vinny today was hilarious. If you can go find the video, Alex tweeted out from the Royals farm account. Vinny hit a ball off the top of the wall on a 
friggin' rope. I don't know how hard he hit it, but it had to have been 100, 510. Yeah, it was 100, 510 off the top of the wall, and it was a single because they were playing an overshift. And I'm pretty sure that the center fielder was playing from the parking lot behind center field and ran in to like make the play so that it was a, just a single. But really, they're playing him like on the warning track. And I'm yeah, pretty I sure that, that was the right the, fielder. He the was right fielder the- might have been at, in the parking lot, and the center fielder was playing on the warning track. <laughs> The right fielder was like on the warning track and right and like straight right center. And I was like, what? Like, what are they doing? And then Vinny hits it over his head off the wall. It was I, like, I think, I think Jake Eisenberg posts 107, 108 miles an hour. I mean, he just hit the piss out of it. So anyway, he's, he continues to be very good. So thank you to Drum Farm for the minor league, picking up minor league minute this year and the supporters of Drum Farm. I feel like we should mention that every once in a while. So thank you to the supporters of Drum Farm. Uh, for helping everybody out with the minor league minute this year. Last thing here, Joel. Um, MLB draft is less than a month away. June Mary, 7th, Mary, Mary Draftmas, July. sir. Yeah, Mary Draftmas. Mary Draftmas. July 17th is a Sunday, rounds one and two. July 17th, that Sunday, we're trying to work out something where we can all live stream together publicly. We will see what that all looks like. It may just be a live stream here on, on stream yard, but hoping to get out in public and, and join some of you guys for the MLB draft. If you guys are so inclined, we will see how that goes, but really quick Sunday rounds one and two MLB network slash ESPN. I can't remember like last year. It was like the first little bit was on MLB network and then round two, or maybe round one was on ESPN. You had to flip to MLB network and go online for round two. Something, I don't know. I think that it, sounds right. Whatever. It's it was. so annoying how they do it, but yeah, it's almost always on MLB Network. The Royals have the ninth overall pick, the 35th overall pick, something like the 43rd overall pick, and then they start to go in order every 30 after their first four picks or something like that. But I think they have four in the top 100. Maybe it's five in the top 100. It's a really good opportunity to add some more talent to the system. Yep. Uh, we will have plenty of draft coverage coming up here in the next month or so. Really quick, two guys I'm watching personally for that number nine pick, Jacob Berry and yet Jace Young. Jacob Berry is an outfielder slash DH from LSU. Switch hitter, great hit tool, maybe the best hit tool in the class with a lot of raw power, decent approach, not a great athlete, but he can run well. He's not like Billy Butler on the bases. He's no Whit Merrifield either. And then Jace Young is probably a second or third baseman maybe the best overall college bat in the draft class, in my opinion, in terms of power, hit tool, and approach. He has less hit tool than Barry, but more power, more approach. So I think they balance out there a bit. He's not probably an outfielder, but I think you could throw him in left field and hide him because he's a good enough, ath- good enough athlete. The reason I'm watching Barry and Young, if the Royals can get one of them, I think you take them, you can put them straight in high A. They won't. They'll put them in low A. But I think you could put them straight in high A, start them at double A next year, and then you're talking about a 2024 arrival for a big thumper in the middle of your lineup. Either way, I think the college hitters available are too good not to take. Go yep. get the best college hitter available. Hope they can be in the middle of your lineup by 2024. And, and and profit that way because I think this team needs thumpers in the middle of the lineup, even with the guys who are coming. And I think by adding one of these guys, you can really set yourself up for a nice playoff run 2024-2025. The guy I'm watching later on – or actually, Joel, go ahead and give us your two guys you're watching at number nine. So the two guys I really like are guys that I talked about on uh, One Royal Way with Jared Perkins a couple weeks ago. You can still go check that episode. It's the most recent episode of that particular show on the KCSN, Kansas City Royals uh, podcast channel. But I brought up Cam Collier, uh, third baseman from Chipola Junior College. He should have been going to his high school prom uh, instead of hitting baseballs in junior college, but he reclassified, graduated early, and he's currently on the Cape, the Cape Cod League, the best college summer league killing it right now against guys that are 21 22 years old the it's such an advanced hitter for being that age i don't even think he's turned 18 yet or if he did he's just he's just now fresh 18 years old it's like a think about like mike moustakis it's that type of stockier build a lot of power really good bat to ball skills a solid approach he's a good enough fielder decent enough runner 
he's a guy that you can plug in and he's not going to be the fast track type that you're talking about, with like a barrier young who even I think could probably slot in net in 23, to be honest, like, but that's how highly I think of Barry and young, but Collier has a super high ceiling and probably a better chance to be a little more than just a bat only guy that I think young and Barry more are like, I love him, but the performance on the Cape makes me think he's not even going to make it to number nine. When a month ago, I thought he is going to be there. And that is one that I would run to Scott's New Jersey and make that pick. But I don't think he's going to be there. But I, we can all cross our fingers that a couple teams play the underslot game and he he's there. The other guy's Gavin Cross, who I know, Alex, you're not as much in love with him, but he, he's a good enough player. Uh, stupid batted ball data hits the ever loving crap out of the ball. The hit is not a fantastic hit tool, but he's certainly got good bats of ball skills, really good power. He was able to get to his power a little more this year. He was able to cut down on strikeouts. He's walking more. So that tells me there's a little bit more of an advanced plate approach there that the Royals certainly could like. And he's someone that you make him maybe a tweak or two, let just lock him in a, a you know, a basement with Drew Saylor in a batting cage and a, a bucket of balls and let that work. And, he he's played some center field for Virginia Tech. He's played some right. Probably could play either. Like I think he's a much better right fielder, and you can play him in center field and pinch. He's a good enough athlete, good enough runner. So I think that, and that certainly feels like a Royals type of guy. And I I want them to go. And as much as I love Young, I love Collier, I love Barry. I want to see them go get a college center fielder. I know you don't necessarily draft for need in the NMLB draft because you're not expecting this guy to come in and start for you right away, but the Royals don't have, like you said, it's Diego Hernandez. That's the only guy that you think you could legitimately slot into it, playing center field every day in the big leagues. That's not good for any system, no matter how good your system is. So you go and get him, go and get a chase the water, something like that. If he, if you want to maybe the way that the mock drafts have, have fallen, you maybe could underslot DeLauder and get him at nine because he probably will go in the teens or low twenties. That could be an option there, there as well, but there's certainly a ton of college bats. And this is not saying we don't like the pitchers, but the Royals need to go bat in this draft. Like you need to go and invest in a bat early in this draft. One thing too, I want to remind people about the MLB draft as opposed to the NFL draft is under slotting is not inherently cheap. They're going to spend, I think their draft pool is 13 mil. Maybe it's 11 and Every mil, team is around that. Around there. So they're going to spend that amount of money. They're going to spend all of it. It's just a matter of who they spend it on. So it's, I don't even know of a good way to ex- explain this, but it's kind of like if you were going to buy two cars, you can have the Audi R8, and a 1994 Ford Focus with 250,000 miles on it. Or you can get two really nice, I, I'm not a big car guy, so this may not even make sense, but like two nice Lexus, right? You can get two nice sedans, two really nice, good-looking cars, or you can get the high-end sports car and a clunker off the lot, right? I mean, what would you rather have? It's just it's just a it's just preference. It's not necessarily even that because if you're if you think about it from the Royals perspective, we can pay guy number 9 on our board 5 million dollars or we can pay guy number 14 on our board 3 million dollars, right? And and just because the media says, "Hey, Frank Mazzucato is the 40th best prospect." The Royals might be looking at Frank Mazzucato going we think this guy is like the second best pitching prospect in the draft. We can get him at number not at number seven for what? Frank Mazzucato signed for like 66% of his slot. One thing to keep in mind for this year is that anybody at the combine that accepts MLB's top 300 status is guaranteed 75% of their slot as long as they have presented a pre-draft medical. So there is some a caveat coming to the to the draft games but regardless under slotting is not inherently cheap i am tired of hearing people say that so if you're listening to this and i ever catch you saying that again we can meet out you me and what was that that running back's name um oh uh darwin thompson darwin thompson you me darwin thompson can meet out in the parking lot of walgreens and we can we can hash it out there so anyway the the, the royals for perspective here 
the Royals drafting Frank Mazzucato where they did allowed them to go and get Ben Kuderna and Carter Jensen, where if they were not, if they did not overslot those two guys, they would have gone to college and you're not drafting Ben Kuderna and Carter Jensen in two years. No. So that's just the way it's not an exact science guys. It is completely different. So if you try, if you're going into this, if you're a Chiefs fan and you casually follow the Royals and you're look watching our, our coverage of the the draft and you think the Royals like, oh, why are they going and being cheap on this? Like they're not. They're it's just the way that the game is played. It's so different than the NFL draft because you're not drafting a guy to go in and be like uh like George Karloftis. You're not expecting, you know, you the Royal or the Chiefs drafted George Karloftis to be their starting edge rusher across from Frank Clark. The Royals are not drafting Cam Collier to be their starting third baseman in 2023. They're they're doing that to get to be your starting third baseman in 2025, right? It's just different. It's so it's so different. Exactly. So really quick, we got one player each to watch. I'm going to mention a local kid, Jacob Mizorowski. Jacob Mizorowski is a former Oklahoma State commit. He is a Grain Valley high school kid who wound up not going to Oklahoma state. He wound up at Crowder college down in Neosho, Missouri. He is really tall, really lanky throws a hundred miles an hour with semi regularity, uh, kind of a project, but you're talking about a Juco kid. So he's still pretty young, still very raw. Again, grain Valley high school kid who I would not be surprised to hear his name called on day two for the Royals. Maybe even that first second round pick the Royals have. Local kid, big arm, very projectable. I could 100% see Jacob Mizorowski in a Royals Royals uniform coming up on draft day. The guy that I'm going to talk about is completely a homer pick because after the first round, you talk about throwing spaghetti at the wall. That's all it is. Like It's like, okay, we'll see what happens. But Nolan McClain from Oklahoma State uh, was originally at Oklahoma State as a two-way, or not only a two-way player, but a two-sport guy. He played quarterback. for Oklahoma State, he didn't actually see any game action, but was on the roster as like the third guy, third quarterback, something like that. And he pitched more this year than he did last year. Legit seventy, I, I'd say the raw like raw power is probably eighty, game power is probably 65, 70. Just tape measure shots when he can get to it. He strikes out a ton, but again, you lock him in a basement with Drew Saylor for a couple of months and a bucket of balls and a tee. I bet they could probably work into it. But the option here is. He then goes on the mound and is 96 to 99 with cut and a slider that probably grades out 60 to 70. It is a, it's a sweeper. So it is just gross. I, I love the power and I think there's enough approach there. Cause he, he was pretty good about taking walks. He just, the swing and miss was horrendous that I think he probably could make it. He's played some third. He's played some left. He's a, a really solid athlete. Like I said, he played football. So you can, he's a really good athlete. He played, they put him at second base. He had never played second base before showing up at Oklahoma state, but they just wanted his bat in the lineup. So they just put him out there. He can play just about anywhere on the corners infield or outfield, but the potential of, I think there is a legit potential that he could be a fast track reliever with the stuff that he has that gives the Royals options. So that's why I think he would be a really intriguing pick. I actually think guys like that should be, thought of more in rounds three through five is fast track relievers. Now, the last time I thought about this with the guy was Durbin Feltman, who I thought Durbin Feltman would come out of, I want to say TCU, but now I can't remember. Durbin Feltman would come out of college and just fly right through the system and be a big league reliever in a year or two. It has not worked for him in the Boston Red Sox, but you get the point. Draft more of these college relievers. Draft more guys like Ben Joyce. uh, Oh, uh, yeah. Tennessee kid's name. The the lefty. Um, oh, uh, I don't know the lefty. For the White Sox. Garrett Crochet. Oh, crochet, Crochet. Garrett Crochet came in and, and started pitching for the White Sox immediately. Brandon Finnegan types, right? Like, go get more of those guys and put them in your team and so you don't have to spend money there. So, yep. anyway, I think Nolan McClain would be a great pick in rounds four or five. And I could also yeah. see them going, hey, what the hell, and just letting him two-way it for a little while because he actually handled it pretty well. By by the end of the year, he was hitting he was hitting like five hole for Oklahoma State, and then just going out on the mound and blowing shit in the ninth inning. Like he was the closer. They just go out there and just get hot and go. If there's anybody else, I just want it. I don't think it'll happen. But can we get the Hispanic Titanic to Kansas City? 
I'm in. Pick number 35. Go get him. Go get him. Make sure he is in a Royals uniform. No, we don't need more first basemen, but everybody needs guys who can hit like that. I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Put a I, put a monopoly on the market of Melendez's. Yes, I'm totally fine with that. Like, I'm glad that I don't have to watch him in that god awful burn orange uniform anymore because uh, I got bounced today by Texas A&M. But that was my College World Series pick. That's, that's not you're good. an idiot. They went over two. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Any final thoughts tonight? Um. Well, I said we'll be back on one Royal Way this week after uh, the week off last week, which I think might have been good for all of us considering the way the season is going right now that I think maybe a week off in the middle of the season was uh, was good for all involved. My only final thought of the night is <laughs> I was going to go there. I'm not going to go there tonight. Well, we'll wait. We'll wait another week for, for that take. I just had to stop myself mid take there. Um, but my final thought of the night for real is I don't know how anybody can prefer cold weather to this. Like, I get it. It's kind of hot outside, but the people who are like, Oh, give me winter or give me death. Like this is, it's a little hot, but this is so much better than winter. Are you a summer over winter guy or a winter over summer guy? The only redeemable thing about summer is that baseball is being played. Stop. Like I am a fall winter guy over it being 108 outside. Like how I, don't, I just don't like it as much. Like it's fine. I can tolerate it. But I I am much more of a like jeans and hoodie guy than like shorts and Hawaii or like shorts and a t shirt guy. I I don't get it. I don't understand how you can prefer to be frozen over. And you know how this is? There's actually like scientific proof of this. Do you know that people live on the equator? Yeah, makes sense. Do you to know me. that people don't live on the north and south poles? Yeah, because you can't survive when it's that cold out. You can't. Summer greater than winter scientific fact we will be back with another episode of the royals farm report podcast next week thank you for listening thank you to joel for being wrong about being cold we will see josh again next week he had a family thing to take care of tonight so thanks for listening we'll see you all again real soon thanks to our sponsors thanks to tucker thanks to bj thanks to kcsc we'll see you guys real soon